Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. Today, our guest is William Davison. William is Crisis Group's senior analyst on Ethiopia and our lead analyst on the Nile Dam dispute. He's here to discuss the progress or lack thereof on talks over Ethiopia's Grand Renaissance Dam. We last covered the Nile Dam back in March, but we're back again as the dispute has only grown more heated. Ethiopia says it will begin to fill the dam next month, but downstream countries Egypt and Sudan want to sign a deal before that happens. Negotiations, though, have yet to break the impasse. Just a note, this story is rapidly progressing, and since we recorded this episode, there has been a number of new developments, which you'll hear us discuss towards the end of the episode. William, welcome back to our podcast. Thank you very much, Alan. So we last covered the the dispute over the Nile Dam in an episode in March, and at that time, U.S.-based negotiations between Egypt and Ethiopia, but also with Sudan, had broken down. Um, what's taken place since then? There's been a lot of new developments. Um, so where do things stand right now? Well, right now, um, we're in the midst of resumed negotiations, um, and, I w- and I will get on to that. Um, but essentially, you know, after the breakdown of the, the U.S. World Bank process, um, where Ethiopia rejected the draft agreement, uh, Egypt's focus then was was really on sort of diplomatic efforts uh, to uh, inform uh, the international community about the situation, but also to try and get Ethiopia to reconsider. Ultimately, that wasn't successful. Um, you know, Ethiopia showed no signs of of, of reconsidering uh, this draft agreement. Another significant event was Ethiopia proposing on the 10th of April an interim agreement on the first two years of filling the Renaissance Dam, um, but that was rejected um, by uh, both Cairo and Khartoum. Uh, the other thing that's happened um, since then is that uh, we're also um, this issue was brought to the UN Security Council's attention. Um, initially with a letter from Egypt that was then responded to um, from Ethiopia and then finally Sudan. So this was another example of um, Egypt um, trying to uh, increase the international focus on on, on the issue. Um, That hasn't necessarily come to anything. And then there was a process of Sudan and Prime Minister Hamdok making efforts to try and get the parties to return to the negotiating table. And that's what happened on the 9th of June. And now we are in the middle of resumed uh, trilateral um, negotiations with a new set of observers. So so in some ways, not much has changed. But the main factor here is, and I'm not sure everyone is always aware of this because this issue has really been around and building for so long, but that Ethiopia has promised to start filling this dam in July, which of course is means very, very shortly. Um, so this is at the 11th hour, so to speak. So, so how is that playing into all of this as well? Well, of course, that's you know, raising, ra- raising, raising the stakes here. It means that there is uh, an increasingly narrow window of opportunities for the parties to reach a deal. And, and the issue here is that um, both Egypt and Sudan, and also the US, their position is that Ethiopia you know, must not start filling the reservoir um, without an agreement. The Ethiopian position, and has been for a long time, is that filling is just one part of construction. And they say that construction has been approved by the downstream parties. um, And they say, essentially, that they will not be knocked off course of filling. And my understanding is that construction has almost reached the stage um, where water can start to be impounded in the reservoir. So now it's really just a question of finalizing those last pieces of construction that are needed, and then there being enough water in the Blue Nile River um, to start backing up into the reservoir. And, and that's expected to be sometime in, in, in mid-July. So while there's all this pressure on Ethiopia, there's no sign of them bowing to the pressure, and they're absolutely set on filling as soon as possible. And so we're sort of in a situation in which if nothing changes, uh, the dam starts filling in a few weeks. Is, is that correct? Or is it not really that inevitable? No, I think, you know, for, for all intents and purposes, that's the situation. I mean, as I said, you know, Ethiopia is absolutely set on it. Um, the rains are coming down already. You might even be able to hear them now um, in, in Ethiopia's highlands. There will be enough water in the Blue Nile to start impounding it in the reservoir. 
Uh, you, you know, whether Ethiopia could delay um, if they wanted to is an engineering issue, I guess, to some emergency facility. But they've certainly got absolutely no intention of delaying filling. Let's talk about these new talks that have started up. Um, they're trilateral between Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia directly, but it also now has some outside observers. How are these different than than the sort of talks that, that we've seen uh, fail to make progress in the past? Um, well, I, I guess the, the key difference is the um, is the makeup of the of the observers. So before it was the U.S. and the World Bank, and that was essentially at you know Cairo's invitation. Um, you know, Egypt decided the negotiations were not going anywhere purely trilaterally. So they invited the observers, and that was accepted by the other parties. At uh, this time around, each party has selected an observer. So uh, Sudan invited the European Union. Um, Egypt invited the U.S. in the form of the Treasury, and Ethiopia invited South Africa, who are, um, as we understand it, acting um, on, uh, in, in their role as, um, as chair. So I think, you know, it's the observer makeup which is the key difference here. Now, before we dive back into some of the outstanding disputes, many of which we talked about in, in March, but we can sort of update that. More generally speaking, because we're sort of at D-Day, uh, well, or, or heading towards the time in which the dam could start being filled, you know, when we talked to Harry Verhoeven on the last one, he said he was skeptical skeptical for many reasons that a deal could be reached given the domestic political situations in both Egypt and Ethiopia. Um, but he also said it was clear that there wasn't going to be any Egyptian-Ethiopian war. Um, but to no surprise, uh, I think to anyone, we've seen a lot of drumbeats as this July deadline of sorts nears. So what happens if there is no deal and the dam starts filling? Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, this is obviously the sort of absolutely the critical question that we're all facing. I think the first thing to note here is that um, in the first year of filling, Ethiopia is just looking to impound what would be about a tenth of the average annual flow of the Blue Nile. Now, that's not very much water, relatively. So the point here is that the actual material impact of Ethiopia's filling plans um, which might begin next month and for this hydrological year, they are not going to cause downstream water shortage, shortages of any severity. Rather than a hydrological issue, this is much more political. Because, of course, you know, the, the issue is that, that people have said Ethiopia cannot fill without an agreement. On the legal front, there does not seem to be any obvious legal recourse for the downstream nations here. And I think the, the key element there is that Yes, you know, when um, developing um, a project on a transboundary river, you know, according to international legal principles, you're not supposed to cause significant harm downstream. But you do not cause significant harm downstream just by the act of filling unilaterally. Actual harm has to be proven for that to be an issue. So there's certainly no immediate legal recourse there. You know, then we have the UNSC process. Um, you know, is this going to become... A, a feature there? Could there be a resolution on the issue? Well, at the moment, it doesn't necessarily look very likely. And then that leaves, you know, other, um, other, uh, uh, other politics and also this, this, you know, this possibility, which does still seem, thankfully, a very remote possibility of some sort of conflict over the issue. It's very hard to be certain about anything, but it still does look like a rather remote prospect. But maybe we should note that there has been some signs of um, increased tensions, um, including these hostilities um, on the Sudan-Ethiopia border, which were either worse than usual, you know, these are regular localized clashes on disputed territory, they were either worse than usual, or there was more of an effort to publicize them. So are we going to see that sort of increasing destabilization as a sort of, um, you know, as a sort of downstream, um, you know, excuse the pun, but some sort of downstream effect of these, of these tensions over Ethiopia filling without a deal? Yeah, now let's go ahead and, and talk about the, the main technical issues that are there. First of all, there, there's really two of them, as I understand it. Um, there's the issue of the drought mitigation measures in terms of filling the dam. And then there's the issues of dispute resolution. Uh, can you walk us through, first of all, on the drought mitigation measures, what the dispute is about, and then what Crisis Group is proposing could be possible solutions to that impasse? Sure. And, 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 you know, to answer that, you know, first, I want to say what the dispute is not about. And that's what it's often reported to be about. We, we will see frequently 
um, in in articles about this uh, dispute that you know Egypt wants to fill the dam in uh, the dam to be filled in twelve years, whilst Ethiopia wants to do it in three years. It's highly misleading. Um, the circumstance here is that Ethiopia's um, proposed filling schedule um, is accepted by Sudan and Egypt, but that's conditional. It's conditional on there being at least average rainfall during the filling period. If that occurs, Egypt and Sudan are quite happy for this dam to be filled in five years. Maybe if there's some slightly dry years, it could take seven years. And, you know, I have it directly from e Egyptian negotiators that there is enough water stored in their Aswan Dam to compensate. Now, the point of saying that is that, you know, this problem is not as bad as people make out, but what this means is that the whole issue is about how the dam is filled and operated um, during years or maybe uh, you know, consecutive years when there is below average rainfall. And then we get on to the issue of drought mitigation. Um, you know, to, try and, you know, to try and simplify this issue, what Ethiopia rejected in, in the February deal was a proposal for a multi-year drought mitigation scheme. And the key element of that which Ethiopia rejected is that if there was a multi-year drought, then Ethiopia would end up owing some amount of water to sort of compensate for the below average releases um, in the period after the drought. Now, I know that sounds a bit complicated, but you know, the way that um, Ethiopia explained this and, and, and you know, the sort of principle backing their position is that they say any arrangement like that where they end up owing water downstream is only appropriate for a, um, a basin-wide multilateral treaty wh wh where water allocation is codified and quotas are, are dished out. The Ethiopia says they are not willing to get into anything which they consider to be a water sharing agreement as part of drought mitigation mechanisms. So that's the situation we're in. Um, and drought and drought mitigation is a very serious issue here. It's a sensitive and, and genuinely serious and difficult issue. Um, you know, the independent, all the independent experts recognize that. At the moment, you know, what Ethiopia, what the most practical way forward seems to be for Ethiopia to adopt, you know, quite a generous form of annual drought mitigation. So quite generous releases from its storage in the event of drought. And then, you know, some sort of um, fleshed out plan um, for how it will manage a multi-year drought. So, you know, being, again, being quite generous about the amount that it's willing to run down the storage at the GERD. And, you know, and the problem here is that if Egypt wants everything set out in advance. They want everything to be set out in tables, you know, mapped out for years in advance. Ethiopia's position is they want something much more dynamic and flexible. Now, that has some logic um, because we are dealing with a very dynamic environment, right? But the problem is that Ethiopia needs to find a way of reassuring Egypt and Sudan about how it will manage a multi-year drought, even if there is an element of this being um, negotiated and, and worked out on a kind of year-by-year -year, um, dynamic basis. Now, on that other issue then on dispute resolution... Um, Egypt has always sought a, you know, some sort of uh, dispute resolution that could be binding. Um, Ethiopia has always resisted that. Uh, where are things at now? And, and again, where, where do we see possible compromise? So if the drought mitigation is, you know, highly sensitive and, and complex, um, but essentially there's quite a lot of sort of wiggle room for the engineers and, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of come up with some sort of technical compromise. On dispute resolution, we're looking at something much more uh, straightforward and a binary disagreement, as you sketched out. You know, is it going to be a binding arbitration at the end of, um, you know, an, an effort to resolve disputes? Or is it simply going to be a matter of negotiations between the parties which Ethiopia favors? There's no light and shade there. Um, so either Ethiopia submits to a binding process um, or Egypt and Sudan give up on the idea of a binding process, um, or both shift in some way. A an alternative uh, or possible approach um, that the crisis group is, is looking at is trying to combine sort of negotiations and a mediated process and, and arbitration. Um, so the negotiations would be between the parties, obviously, 
um, and then there would be a sort of third party mediated process. And there was a particular form of mediation called conciliation, which is a highly formalized process. Uh, the idea is to present evidence and try and reach consensus, and it's sort of non adversarial. Um, and there is this third party conciliator, which offers recommendations, but they're non binding recommendations. So we could have a very formalized process like that, but a non binding one, as the first effort to try and resolve disputes. And then perhaps as a last resort, you know, could there be an African led, an African Union led arbitration process? Because ultimately, at the moment, it doesn't look like Egypt and Sudan are willing to sign up to anything that doesn't have arbitration as, as, the, as the last resort. So, so maybe, you know, if, if both sides are willing to compromise um, on, on, on these issues, then could, could we have some sort of hybrid um, sort of progressive arrangement like that, which, um, which satisfies all parties? And I imagine the reason to have it be an African-led arbitration is that Egypt has always been sort of seeking more international forums, whereas Ethiopia has been pushing to sort of Africanize this issue more or less. So, so in some ways, that's also sort of a, a middle ground in theory. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, these are sort of deeply imperfect solutions. Um, but, you know, I think Ethiopia is very wary of being on the receiving end of, of lots of, of complaints. And, and ultimately, you know, if it was going to submit to arbitration, um, you know, there does seem reason to believe that it thinks that it would get a fairer hearing in an African court rather than at The Hague. One of the things that Crisis Group proposed in, in March was the idea of having an interim deal, given that the countries have been stuck in their positions for some time and a comprehensive deal looks quite difficult. Why is it that the sort of push for an interim deal looks unlikely at this point? Because uh, Egypt and Sudan reject it is, is, the, is the short answer. I think Cairo's concerns here are that um, they're cumulative, right? So these negotiations have been going on for a very long time. There's lots of mistrust. And they essentially, you know, they accuse Ethiopia of, 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 of just sort of dragging their feet here and, and making the GERD a fact on the ground. So Cairo is very unwilling to sign up to an agreement which sort of effectively gives further blessing and, 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 and backing for the GERD, but, you know, without these assurances about drought mitigation. So they're, they're kind of unwilling to allow GERD to become even more of a reality without assurances on these matters of absolute key national interest. And as far as I understand the Sudanese position on this matter, it's a similar, it's a similar line of, of reasoning. Um, and, you know, again, from the crisis group perspective, an interim agreement really still looks like a objectively um, a, a practical way forward here. The way Ethiopia rejected the drought mitigation proposals was to say that Egypt was trying to perpetuate its hegemony and, and maintain its unfair quotas of Nile waters. So we do worry that there isn't a time for a comprehensive agreement. Therefore, a time buying piecemeal approach does seem to make sense. But unfortunately, it doesn't look politically very likely because of the Sudanese and Egyptian opposition to it. Yeah, and I think as this reaches sort of the final hours, so to speak, I don't think really anyone would be surprised if, if maybe everything heads towards an interim deal almost by necessity. Now, Egypt rejecting an interim deal wasn't exactly so much of a surprise, but it seems Sudan's position on that um, was quite determinative um, and was surprising perhaps based off of its previous positions. Sudan under Omar al-Bashir was a supporter of the dam, which was, of course, something that didn't please Cairo too much. Why, why does it look like Sudan is sort of taking a, a harder position on this and in some ways taking a position that often appears closer to Cairo now? I think there's a number of factors behind that. Um, and it, yeah, I mean, you, you, you mentioned the, the, the era of Bashir. Well, we're in a different era now. So I think there's just some sort of like autonomous and, and maybe somewhat natural assertion of Sudanese rights and interests here. Um, you know, they, they do have these concerns about uh, the coordination of the dams, the dam safety. Uh, they see risks and benefits um, to the GERD. Um, you know, major benefits in terms of cheap electricity, reduced flooding, increased irrigation potential, and increased power generation potential at Sudanese dams because of the regulated flow. But they also see these risks. So I think there's just a kind of autonomous assertion of their rights and interests. But maybe that isn't the entire story here. Um, you know, Sudan is obviously in a, in, 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 you know, in, a, in a volatile transition. There's different power centers within the government. Some of those power centers, you know, notably... The military is, is closer to the Cairo 
um, you know, security establishment? Are they being influenced? And is that sort of playing out through Sudanese transitional politics? I do think there's an element of that. Um, there's also the um, state sponsor of terrorism designation. And, you know, I'm sure the Sudanese government is mindful that they do not want to do anything to upset Washington at this time has that influenced their thinking? I think it's a you know I think it's a confluence of, of of these of these factors, and I agree you know it would not have been that surprising if Sudan had taken you know what I would see as a pragmatic approach to to adopt this sort of piecemeal um, interim agreement, but that isn't the decision Sudanese. Uh, the Sudanese have taken, and now everyone has to, uh, you know, accept that and, and live with it, as they're doing now by trying to, um, you know, focus on getting a comprehensive deal. Yeah, and I think the degree to which the fact that Sudan, of course, is going through this political transition, and that, and that, you know, Cairo, and in some ways that has given Cairo uh, more inroads back into Khartoum, is, is is something that we continue to to see as as really affecting where these head as we as we near July. Um, you have sort of two or three or, you know, and more, I'm sure, technical issues that need to be resolved. Um, But then previously in talks, it looks like in some ways this is always a dispute about fundamentally that Egypt has these historic water sharing rights in which it gets the the vast bulk of the of the water and Ethiopia has always rejected those as 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 extremely unfair. In what ways are you know these talks, even though they're they might technically be about technical matters? In what ways is this sort of historical connotation and Ethiopia trying to evade what they see as de facto water sharing agreements? In what ways is that the real obstacle to coming to a comprehensive deal? Yes, yeah, so I think it's the it's the impact of that much broader debate. You know, that just feeds into quite an acrimonious atmosphere, potentially, you know, whether it's from the negotiators, the governments or the, or the, you know, the societies at large, including the media. This doesn't help create the atmosphere for, for constructive talks, um, of, of course. So whilst the GERD is a non-consumptive project, um, it's absolutely correct that this whole water sharing um, issue plays into it. And in many ways, you know, the GERD is, is you know, it's an expression of Ethiopia's renaissance, yes, but it's also an, an assertion of Ethiopia's rights and power. So there is a geopolitical struggle going on here, which is framing um, these problematic negotiations. And then, you know, just to go back to one of my earlier points, if we look at one of the technical issues, drought mitigation, highly complex, yes, highly sensitive, but highly complex, you know, really suitable to be sorted out by hydrological engineers, essentially. Well, when Ethiopia rejected um, their proposals on, 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 on drought mitigation, it wasn't on technical terms. They said that these drought mitigation proposals were designed to secure Egypt's unfair allocation of Nile waters. So then we can see the, the political backdrop to this feeding into the technical talks. Is it really possible to sign one of these agreements while evading the, the water sharing issue? Or in some ways, at the end of the day, the reason it's very complicated to get to this deal is that both Egypt and Ethiopia are sort of going to compare it to see if it it protects or or uh, moves past these old water sharing agreements. I don't want to downplay the difficulty of something like um, you know how to agree these drought mitigation proposals. It is very sensitive um, and and tricky stuff, and it's easy to sort of run into difficulty um, of of the type that occurred in in February with these Ethiopian allegations. But ultimately. You know, it, it is possible to reach a deal um, on the on the GERD filling rate, uh, on dispute resolution, on drought mitigation, um, on on these other issues. Um, it, it it is possible to do that. It's it's difficult given the political atmosphere and given this kind of water sharing issue and the, the failure of the the cooperative framework process, that multilateral treaty to govern the Nile Basin. It is difficult, but it's not impossible. Like you mentioned, we've seen Egypt really ramping up. Uh, diplomatic pressure on Ethiopia. Clearly, Ethiopia must be feeling some pressure from that, no? Um, yes and no. I mean, they're, they're, they're certainly aware of it. Um, but, you know, I think, um, you know, there was something quite hard-nosed about the Ethiopian approach to the Renaissance Dam. And, you know, they, they are the dam owner. Uh, they do have a sovereign right to develop their own resources you know they have deliberately self-financed the dam and i think when you when you weigh up the ethiopian concern about signing up to an agreement where they essentially sort of forfeit 
um, their rights to you know, maximize the benefits from GERD or utilize their own water resources because they sign up to something which they regret a decade down the line. They are much, much more concerned about doing that. Um, and this is as much, as far as one can tell, this is the public position. They're much more concerned about that than they are about some external intervention that's going to cause them problem. And actually, you know, all these threats of you know, efforts at diplomatic pressure and threats of external intervention, in many ways, they're making the Ethiopians double down and more resolute on their key objectives here to finish the project and, and start to uh, reap the benefits of it. Would you say that this has all served to bolster Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed um, so far, or or could this still have a sort of upsetting role in Ethiopia's very fragile domestic politics at the moment? Uh, you know, there's no there's no there's no black or white answer to, to that one. You know, c clearly, go you know, governments and, and leaders do do benefit from rallying the populace around external enemies, and maybe you know, maybe that's something which. Um, is useful for the for the current Ethiopian government, but you know this was a project that, that, that the prime minister inherited. It's a massively important project for Ethiopia. It was designed to bring the Ethiopian people together, anyway, and there is no option but to sort of go ahead and and finish it. But I wouldn't say that the sort of diplomatic situation the prime minister has has found himself in. Um, because of this is is a particularly comfortable one. You know, of course, uh, the U.S. is not just an ally of, of Egypt, but it's also an ally of, of Ethiopia. Um, there's been no repercussions of that yet, but the, there is concern. The same with the Gulf powers. Um, you know, the, the, the Saudis and the Emirates have been important partners um, of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's administration. But of course, this this debate over the GERD does strain those relations. It strains relations with Sudan as well, as we've discussed. So, yeah, I mean, there is some potential benefit in you know, trying to get a divided nation, which Ethiopia is, to focus on this national project and also on potentially on uh, external enemies. But I, I don't think it's just a sort of, um, you know, it's, not, it's not a sort of resounding win for, 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 for the prime minister. If this doesn't get resolved in the coming weeks, um, which of course I think wouldn't be a surprise to anyone, although of course we, we hope that there is, uh, some 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 notable progress in the negotiations. What do we think escalation, um, especially by Egypt over this issue, will will look like or could look like? Well, I think there's the um, there's the, the focus on the UN Security Council. Um, so perhaps if the perhaps um, if if the US administration lent its support to Egypt there, that could be one avenue that they pursue. It's still not entirely obvious. Um, how that process, even if it was picked up at the UNSC, how it would kind of materially impact things on the ground or change the Ethiopian stance. Um, but that is one that is one possible avenue. Um, there will be legal activity um, because the Egyptian position is that Ethiopia would be in breach of international legal principles and and also the uh, Declaration of Principles on the GERD signed in 2015. But as discussed. That doesn't necessarily seem to be going anywhere. So it's it's really it's not apparent, um, you know, what the effects of this will be. But it is just kind of obvious that there will be an increase in tensions, um, and there is just concerns about um, you know a, a process of regional um, destabilization. But exactly sort of what form that will take is is just by no means clear at this moment. Yeah, we've been seeing escalating rhetoric all around the region, um, you know, not just with Sudan, Ethiopia, Egypt, but also involving South Sudan and Somalia. So it'll be interesting to see where this heads from here. I mean, I think I think the main takeaway that this conversation really highlights is that in many ways, you know, Egypt is still struggling really to, to, to find leverage against Ethiopia. And in many ways, Ethiopia's strategy has been somewhat successfully to just create new facts on the ground um, and to keep moving ahead. And Egypt, Egypt is, is still clearly sort of struggling to figure out how to, how to counter that dynamic. As, as, as these talks do move ahead in the coming weeks, uh, William, what is it specifically that you'll be really looking for? Well, what we're looking for here um, is, you know, somewhat obviously, you know, for the, for the parties to make concessions in, in key areas. And I think the international actors have a big role to play here um, in, you know, speaking to their allies 
um, you know, pointing out that, you know, again, something obvious, which is that you know, this is leading to increasing um, tensions and, and potentially to hostilities even down the road. So it's a question of, you know, trying to get the parties to do more to acknowledge the legitimate concerns of the other party. So, you know, Sudan's damn safety concerns, Egypt's, um, Ethiopia's very strong desire to develop its own resources and, and to utilize the Blue Nile, and obviously Egypt's concerns about its water supplies. Each party needs to focus um, and really try and empathize with those other, with the, with the other party's concerns, and that should help, you know, to create or to begin to create the political atmosphere um, to reach these technical compromises on the issue of, of, of dispute resolution and drought mitigation. I just think it's got to the stage in the, in the dispute and in the negotiations. Everyone knows where each party stands. Most neutral observers um, acknowledge the, the, the various sort of legitimate claims that the parties have. But that obviously only goes so far. So I really think it's time for people to start appreciating the other's concerns. And then overarching this is a need to see the Nile and the Nile Basin as a zone of cooperation and not as a zone of zero-sum competition. I mean, there is just no real way to effectively and efficiently manage a transboundary water course um, and for everyone to get benefits from it until there is some concept of you know, seeing the mutual benefits from, from, um, from cooperation and recognizing that a zero-sum approach is, is only going to lead to harm and, and ultimately against the nas uh, national interests in the long term. Hi, everyone. Since recording this episode, we brought William back on the podcast to talk over a few updates. So since we talked a few days ago, we've had a number of new developments. Um, the talks ended without a deal. Um, also, Egypt has now written to the UN Security Council calling this a matter of imminent threat to international peace and security. Quite ominous, uh, of course, though unclear as we discussed if this has any actual substance behind those threats. Um, also, the, the White House tweeted out that Ethiopia needs to sign a deal before filling the dam, which clearly puts is designed to put pressure on Addis Ababa. So where do all these things leave us now? Well, I think unfortunately what we've seen is uh, you know, a continuation of some of the worrying uh, trajectories that we talked about in the, uh, that we talked about before. Um, so first of all, with the talks themselves, I mean, there was some progress made uh, on this drought mitigation issue. Um, you know, there's a sort of agreement on drought thresholds and, and, that, and that type of thing. Um, and there's actually been t quite a lot of talk of like 90 to 95 percent of technical issues being resolved. Unfortunately, this was all essentially torpedoed by a major legal dispute over the actual status of the agreement. You know, whether it would be binding under international law or whether it w would be just what Ethiopia called guidelines and rules for the operation of the dam. So that's a major sticking point. Um, and that's, you know, led e Egypt to continue its sort of positioning of saying that Ethiopia does not want to deal. And that, of course, um, led to the breakup of the talks. And then it led to Egypt writing a, uh, a second letter to the United Nations Security Council a few days later. And then also this, this tweet from the um, U.S., um, NSC. Um, none of this is good news. Um, it means that, you know, whilst there was some progress made in the talks, there no longer are talks. And instead, that diplomatic escalation we talked about um, is, is prominent. Um, it's still not really clear what Egypt is expecting from this UNSC process, or indeed what might come from it. And it does still look like Ethiopia is going to essentially double down here and remain committed to filling the dam next month. Um, the role of the U.S. is going to be important. Um, they seem minded to strongly back up the Egyptian position, but we don't know exactly what that amounts to yet. So we will have to wait and see. Um, but none of it looks very positive, And really what needs to happen is the parties need to get back to talks, to trilateral talks, and try and hammer out these remaining issues, whether they're on the final pieces of drought mitigation or whether they're on these legal issues relating to the legal status of the agreement um, and the dispute resolution issue. Because unless we get back to talks, then it looks like um, relations could continue to worsen. Well, Will, thanks for coming on our podcast and enjoy the rains in Addis Ababa. Okay, thank you very much, Alan.
Thanks for listening. The Horn is a podcast produced by the International Crisis Group. For those who want more background on this topic, you can go back and listen to the episode we released on it in March. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell, and this episode was produced by Mae Francis.